This is an SBC Media Partners production. Swung on, hit high and deep. Right field. Let it be. Let it be. It is out of here. Phillies fans, these are your glove stories with Murph. Let's check in with Greg Murphy. Murph, you got a special guest, huh? Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Glove Stories with Murph. I'm Leslie Goodell. I want to thank my friend Greg Murphy for asking me to be a part of this today. Uh, I love being able to talk Phillies anytime I get a chance, especially with an old friend who I'll introduce in just a moment. We are brought to you by the Bet Parks Casino Sportsbook app, Shy Vintage Sports, and Phillies Nation. Again, I'm Leslie Goodell. And later on in the podcast, Murph, We'll be in to chat with Larry Boa and Charlie Manuel. They're going to talk a little bit about the players who are have come up and are really helping this uh, 2022 Phillies team stay in the playoff race and um, and keep them winning. And they've done a great job of that recently. And our special guest today made a huge impact in the Phillies run in 1980. And in fact, um, I, mean, I would I I, li- I would like to say that I think you were the, are the most underrated player in terms of when we talk about the 1980 team, Marty Brystrom, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's great to be here. Great to see you again. It's been a long time. And, I know. Uh, I know. I think we were probably on the golf course last time we ran yes, together. Yes, that's right. So um, we'll get to the 1980 team. And that's, you know, that'll be the bulk of our stories today, I'm sure, because that was such an exciting September for uh, for the team, but really for you personally and all that you were able to accomplish that year and really left your mark on uh, on your baseball career at that time. But let's back up. You you grew up in the Miami area. You live back in Florida now um, on the East Coast. But, you know, talk about your upbringing around baseball. What, you know, when you when you really fell in love with the sport. Uh, that was at a very young age. Um, my, uh, my father, both my parents are from up, upstate New York and my dad went to the university of Miami on a football scholarship and he ended up getting hurt and, and, uh, wasn't able to fulfill that, but, uh, stayed in Miami area. And so I was born and raised in Miami and he being, uh, a, a big sports, uh, nut and athlete, uh, he built a mound actually in my backyard when I was six years old. And so he would come home from work every night and we'd get the gloves and the balls out. And, uh, and he taught me how to pitch at, at a young age and, of course, through Little League and all that stuff. And um, so that's where it all started. You know, very rarely in baseball do you hear of anybody starting late. Most people seem to fall in love with the game at a young age. And you ended up going to Miami-Dade Community College. And that's really, uh, you know, where where you got some eyes on you. And, and then you were drafted in the amateur draft in 1976. Talk about how that process all unfolded. Well, um, the Phillies had a, a local scout uh, down in that area, and they had scouted me through high school, but didn't think that I was ready at that point uh, to come out and, and, and get into the draft. So uh, I ended up going to Miami-Dade uh, South Campus, which – at the time, uh, Charlie Green was the coach there and also known as a pitching guru. And um, so I really that's where I really developed uh, under his tutelage. And uh, since I wasn't drafted out of high school, um, there was also at that time there was a, a draft in January and I was slated to be the number one pick. And the Phillies had the 22nd or 23rd pick in that draft. And and uh, they were really about the only team that that was aware of me and, and until um, I, I started blooming at Dade South. And so then all these scouts were involved in calling me all the time in the house. And and uh, the Phillies uh, sent um, uh, Gus Polis was the scout's name down to sign me. Dallas Green actually ordered him to go down there and sign that kid. Uh, we can sign him as a free agent because he wasn't drafted. So. Gus Polis had promised Charlie Green, my uh, college coach, that, uh, you know, they weren't going to do anything with me because um, they were friends and, and so forth. So Dallas Green fired him. He fired Gus Polis and he sent Huey Alexander down uh, to go to go down there and sign that kid. And uh, so Huey came out to the house one night and we wrapped it all up. Uh, and um, uh, so that's that's how I signed as a free agent, because I was never drafted. Yeah, and it's interesting you talk about Dallas being so aware of the fact that you were, you know, you were bloom blossoming in college, and and eventually you'd end up playing for him. Did that relationship, the, the history of that relationship, play a big part in the opportunities you got with the team? Um, I don't know if that did. Um, 
I think, you know, Dallas was, was the director of the minor leagues at that point. And, you know, the Phillies uh, under the Carpenter ownership, uh, you know, they, they really put a lot of money in, into developing minor league talent. And uh, as you know, in 80, uh, he started to sprinkle some of that young talent in with the veterans on that ball club. Um, you know, your Bob Walks and Dickie Knowles and um, Kevin Sauchet, Lonnie Smith, Keith Moreland, those guys. Um, so uh, I think he knew that he had some some talent down in the minor leagues that he could reach down and pull up and, and, and help a ball club in certain situations. Um, so, you know, as the minor league director, yeah, he had watched my career through the minor leagues and felt that I was ready to, to make the jump. So let's, let's fast forward from 76 to 1980. And um, that Phillies team, you know, was struggling to keep up for part of the summer. And then they were really in the thick of things. It was a battle in the, NL East uh, with the Pirates and the Astros in there. And, and I mean, I'm sorry, the Pirates and the Expos. And, you know, September call-ups roll around and, and, and you get the call. What was that call like for you? And, and you know, how much of a turning point was it, obviously, in your life? Well, it's something that I had dreamt about, you know, and, and um, been waiting for for four years uh, since I joined the organization. And I was actually – penciled in as a as a starter coming out of spring training but I had an injury I had pulled hamstring and so I had to I had to rehab that and that took me almost through July uh, before I was actually started to pitch again and uh, down in AAA and I think I reeled off five or six wins uh, towards the end of the season so uh, it wasn't that big of a surprise to get called up um, but uh, certainly enjoyed it and then uh, uh you know, to, to get an opportunity to to uh, help that ball club down the stretch was just beyond my my wildest dreams. So let's go through the first day there and you walk into that clubhouse and, <laughs> and you've got Larry Boa and Greg Luzinski and Steve Carlton and Manny Trio and all of the, you know, and Pete Rose. How intimidating was that? Very intimidating. Um, you know, these are guys that I had been watching on TV the last few years. Um so I was in awe, you know, to walk into to the clubhouse, which was in Candlestick Park, met the team in San Francisco, and to go in there, yeah, and Pete Rose, and here's Mike Schmidt and Steve Carlton, Tug McGraw and Larry Bow and all these guys. It's like, wow, am I really here, you know, uh, to see your name on the back of a jersey hanging in a locker. It's, uh, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, you're just in awe is, is the word that I would use to describe it. So your first appearance was in relief, kind of a, um, yeah. you know, a, a game that you know uh, was a bit of a garbage game on September 7th. I think uh, one scoreless inning you pitched. Yeah. But, you know, before you ended up getting um, put in the starter role, did that give you a sense of confidence that they wanted to get you started in a situation like that where you just got your feet under you a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um you know, I had I had gotten up in the bullpen in San Francisco once, um, and I think uh, looking back and after the fact that they just wanted me to get up in front of a crowd and, and throw in no intention of putting me in the game. But the the opportunity came in L.A. blowout game, and uh, so I pitched the ninth inning. And uh, I remember the first hitter I faced was Ron Say, um, and he hit a little dribbler uh, back to the mound. That's my favorite and, player growing up. That's right, and um, so I ended up three uh, th uh, three up three down inning and so uh, you know from a confidence standpoint I said yeah I said okay I'm here I'm here to stay I can do this and uh it just it just really gave me a lot of confidence were you nervous very nervous yeah <laughs> Dodger Stadium very nervous yes Ron I mean uh, Ron say I've been watching him as a kid Steve Garvey all these guys you know so then uh Larry Christensen goes down with an injury yep how did the process unfold where they're saying we're going to give you the ball the next start? Well, yeah, we, we were in uh, New York and uh, LC uh, had an injury. And so he couldn't make his start. And, and Dallas, uh, um, you know, had, had said to me that uh, you got the ball. And so, um, you know, end up throwing a, a five hit shutout, um, complete game, game, got a base hit, scored a run. Um <laughs> And uh, so it was, uh, wow, all of a sudden, uh, here we are in, a, in the middle of a pennant race, and I just threw a complete game, five-hit shutout. It was crazy. How much did that carry over to the rest, you know, the, the rest of the stretch? Was a lot. That, was that huge? A lot. Um, and also, you know, having 
the supporting cast, uh, you know, the defense behind me. You know, at each level you progress from the bottom of the minor leagues on up, uh, you know, the hitters get better, the defense gets better, the pitching gets better. And uh, so when I finally got to the, got to the major league level, uh, the defense behind me was incredible. Um, Cause these guys going to hit rockets and they're making the plays, you know? So, um, and, and having a guy like Booney behind the plate an experienced veteran catcher uh, that was very good at, at knowing the hitters tendencies and, and how to set them up. And so you just put all your trust in him and, and he put the signs down and you just, you just, uh, you know, threw what he wanted you to do and, and let everything happen. Had you always done that with, with your battery mate, let them call. I know some guys like to, well, now it's completely different, but some guys like to call their own games and would shake guys off. Had you always had that confidence or was it just Bob Boone? Um, I pretty much always had that confidence. Um, maybe not so much at the, in the lower minor league levels, um, but in the, in the triple a level. Yeah. I, you know, just put everything. Keith Moreland was our catcher in triple a at the time when I was there. And uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, you know, maybe occasionally I, I would shake, shake them off and want something else. Um, but very rarely. So the, your first two starts, you throw 17 shutout innings. You're feeling pretty good about yourself. You're starting to, that confidence is obviously there. Your third starts against the Cubs. You go five and a third, you give up three runs. Um, you know, at that point it's like, okay, now I, I'm <laughs> working for this. Got to keep this up. What was that start like against the Cubs? Um, I, I knew going in that I, I think I needed five innings or six innings or something to break a, a, a scoreless record for a rookie. Um, and uh, I think it was the fourth inning. It's been a long time, Leslie. But ah. I, think it, I think it was the fourth fourth inning. And Dave Kingman was leading off the fourth. And I just threw him one of those, get him, get him over slider, first pitch for a strike. And he had a line drive that went over my head and it kept going and going and going and ended up in the center field bleachers out in Wrigley field. So that was the end of that. And, um, um, but, but, uh, you know, to continue and, and end up coming out of, the, out of there with a win, um, was, yeah. was just, it was great. You know, it's funny because I always joke that it's a guy gene that remembers every golf hole they've ever played <laughs> and, and every hit they ever had or pitch. Right. They ever through um i can't remember what i ate for breakfast yesterday but guys have uh, guys are pretty good at that so i have confidence in you being able to get through all of these games yeah. um okay so you got the win of the mets um the expos lost let's see the phillies took over first place. oh that was okay so the mets so you get the win over the mets the expos lose and the phillies take over first place at this point so then now it's like such a tight race september 30th you go in and in, in a double header and and team scores 14 runs for some run support i think you got four in the first um in the first inning um you know did was you were you guys feeling it at that point was there like at what point did you feel like that team knew you guys were going to the postseason i i think right around right around that point um you could feel it um you know september the weather changes and and uh, at home in, in Veterans Stadium, uh, we had big, big crowds um, that, uh, you know, were starving for, for a, a championship. And um, so th there was just a, a, a different uh, energy in, in the air. Um, but I, I think that series against the Mets, was that, was that the one where we beat them five, five games in 48 hours or something no, that, like that? Um, you guys did. Let me see. It's in here somewhere. Yeah, um, there was. It was, I think it was the Mets or the Cubs. We had a five game series at home and uh, we beat them five in less than 48 hours, um, yeah. which was crazy. Two double headers and a single game, I believe. Is that, um, is that a turning point for you? I mean, what, what would you say was the point where you guys really, like, you knew, you knew I, that you were getting there? I don't know if we did because we, we had to go into Montreal at the end for those three games. We had to win, what, two out of three at the end there. Um, <laughs> So uh, it really wasn't until till the Mike Schmidt hits the home run in Montreal that that we knew it. Yep, and that's when then Larry Christensen had come back at this point, right? So yeah. are you kind of it sounds like well to back up, it sounds like they did a really nice job of putting you in a position to succeed um, as a rookie and have the you know have the confidence that you had. Did you feel that they were really conscious of that, or were they just putting you in there because you had to fill in for LC? I, yeah, I think it was the latter. Um, I, I, obviously, Dallas had the confidence in me um, after seeing you know me for so many years in the minor league level. 
um, that, uh, you know, some of these guys could step in and, and perform. So I, I think it was the latter, Leslie. I really do. Uh, LC was down. Uh, I think Randy Lurch was also uh, nursing some injuries and Nino Espinosa. So they needed somebody. And uh, I was that guy. Um, the NLCS was very exciting uh, against the Astros. Um, well, the whole the whole postseason had its share of excitement, but the, but you're going in and facing a guy who's a first ballot Hall of Famer on the other side in Nolan Ryan. Was there a moment where you were like, "How in the world did I get here?" Uh, yeah, and I hadn't I hadn't pitched in I think it was ten days. Um, and uh, after game four, um, I didn't I didn't even know I was pitching game five until after game four. Uh, we were up in the clubhouse and Dallas came over to my locker and handed me a ball. And he said, you got the ball tomorrow, kid. And uh, he says, I know you can do it. So um, that that's when I found out I was pitching against Nolan Ryan uh, in, in game five. And and I remember I, I also reading or hearing that uh, Joe Morgan had said that uh, there's no way a rookie is going to beat us tomorrow. Um, so that gave me a little more incentive, um, but it was, it was a rough one. You know, I, I, I gave up 10 hits in, in what, five and a third or something like that, but, uh, kept, kept us close, um, un, until, uh, they, they went up five, two. And then against, you know, of course against Nolan Ryan, I don't know what the numbers were, but he, you know, he had never lost the lead or something like that going into the eighth inning. And then we score five runs to take the lead. It was just, it was just crazy. I, I love how you focused on the 10 hits. You gave up two runs, though. So it wasn't as though they were <laughs> hitting those 10 hits out of the ballpark. And and it sounds like maybe it was a um, it was a blessing you didn't learn about the start until the night before. Yeah, I was I was very nervous. I mean, the Astrodome was super loud. Um, I, I took a, a, a tip from Steve Carlton and actually put cotton in my ears to try to to to, you know, curb the noise. Um, I've never heard anything like that, that Astrodome, uh, the, the noise level. And, um, so with that, you know, that added just, it just added more pressure. Um, I've, I'd never been in a situation in pitching like that in front of so many people and so loud and, and everything. So, but again, you know, you, you go back to, um, your routine and, and, you know, when you look at other athletes and other sports, golfers have routines and, and, and that's how you, you uh, relieve the pressure is stick to your routine, stay, stay confident. You, you, you know, just trying to repeat what you've done for so many thousands of times and, and uh, let the chips fall where they may. Who on that team influenced you and reminded you of, of things like that to keep you focused? Um, I don't, I don't know at that point if there really was anybody. It's, it's basically when you get there, uh, you're relying on everything that you've learned prior to that. Um, and uh, so you, you're really, I mean, you, you know, you've got pitching coaches and coaches, um, but mechanically or, or, or strategically, uh, they're not so much uh, helping you at that point. Uh, uh, you're relying on on yourself and what got you there, and and relying on your teammates and having confidence again in, in a guy like Bob Boo behind the plate uh, to put down the right fingers. Yeah, I was around some of the '93 team recently, and they were talking about it being the most selfless team they'd ever played on. Was that team was that team the same way? Um, it was. It, I think it was different um, because the mix. You know, it was primarily a veteran ball club. Um, had, had they not achieved it, uh, in 1980, that team would have been, been broken up to pieces. Um, you know, so most of those guys were, were, well, they're actually young by today's standards, you know, 30, 32 years old. Um, so, and then you had young guys, I mean, I was 22, 21. Um, so it was just a different mix and it was a little, there were, you know, little veteran clicks and, and it was totally different than today's game. You know, rookies were to be seen and not heard back then. And, you know, you just wanted to get along and fit in and, and hope that everybody liked you. So uh, then after that Astros game, um, we jumped to the World Series for your next start. And, it, you know, again, are you in a situation where you don't know if you're going to start again? Um, I, I, I believe that I knew – uh, days in advance that that if we got to the fifth game in that situation that I was going to get the ball um, 
And uh, so, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the same situation as as Houston. And after going through the Houston start, um, the World Series seemed to be more relaxed where it shouldn't. But it just seemed to be more relaxed. Uh, and I think, too, you know, it's a four out of seven set versus a three out of five. Um, so it just seemed like a, a the, all the pressure had lifted and it was just more of a relaxed atmosphere in the World Series than it was the Houston Series. It's funny you say that because I remember the 2007 Phillies and how elated they were when they made it to the postseason and and then they just got clobbered by Colorado um, in the first series and and the next year it was like this calm all the way through in 2008 it was sort of like act like you've been there before right and right was right that the sort of feeling that you came that came over you guys like okay we've done the hard stuff like we need to go in there and just do our job yeah and you know. I think that um, we didn't have any qualms about being able to beat Kansas City. I, I mean, I think, you know, when we look back after after finishing off and, and beating Houston, that uh, Houston was a better ball club than the Kansas City Royals. And, you know, they're an American League team. We're a National League team. Um, and uh, back then, you know, the, the American League was looked at as more of an inferior league. Uh, National League was a power league, power pitching, power hitting stolen bases, speed. And uh, so, uh, you know, in our minds, we expected to beat the Kansas City Royals, yeah. but it wasn't that easy. No. Um, well, let's talk about your start. Um, game five, you get yeah. the ball. Yes. And? like, I'm sorry. Are, they, are the nerves any different? Are they, um, are they, like, are you realizing everything that's on the line? Well, you know, it's something you dream of uh, as a kid is, is pitching in a World Series. And and uh, um, so here it was, that, that opportunity. And uh, I, I really wasn't as nervous as I was in the Houston game. Um, after warming up, and I knew Dutch Renner was behind home plate. And Dutch had uh, umpired uh, one, one or two of, two of my games down in September. So he knew me. And uh, he was a little liberal with that outside corner. Uh, which I knew. And so um, I struck out two guys in the first inning. And uh, I think I, I think I ended the first inning uh, striking out um, uh, Willie Mays Aikens on a, on a fastball away that he took. Um, and so, you know, I bounced off the mound, two punch outs in the first inning, like, wow, I got this, you know, and, uh, but it, it was a battle and um, uh, it's, it's almost kind of a blur to me now the the world series versus the the astros series but that was a pivotal game game five you know after game four lc started um you know he gets he gets uh knocked out in the first inning and then you you know it leads up to the dickie knolls knockdown pitch of george brett which i think turned the series around um i think brett went two for ten after that that point and um you know he was really the only guy on that team that I was concerned with, well, Aikens a little bit too. Um, but, but George was the guy that, you know, you, you knew he was going to put the ball in play. So you just were hoping that you could keep it in the ballpark. It's interesting that the Astros series stands out more to you. Why, why do you think that is? Um, I don't know. Maybe it was just the, the energy level in the, in the Astrodome, you know, going from indoors to outdoors. Um, it, um, you know, they, they had such a, uh, uh, an excellent pitching staff led by Nolan Ryan. And, and you know, they were without J.R. Richard, too, you know, because uh, J.R. Richard um, had the stroke that year. So had they have had J.R., things may have been different. Who knows? Um, guys, you know, would rather face Nolan than J.R. Richard, a lot of, a lot of hitters that you talk to. But um, I, I don't know. Um, Maybe it was the day games in Kansas City. It was just more of a relaxed atmosphere. Uh, and then, we, of course, you come home to, to Philly in game six, and that, that atmosphere totally changed uh, with, you know, 65,000 people in the seats there, and, and, uh, and they could smell it. Do, were you, it were, do you remember any moments where you just sort of sat back and looked up in the stands and took it all in? <laughs> uh, every inning. <laughs> uh, every inning, just about. Um, and, uh, Did that feel you know, I mean, so, I was, some of it 
some people What's like that? to not look at that stuff and not and and it can be a distraction it sounds like that kind of energy was what was fueling you it's not a distraction so much uh when you're playing because you're so focused uh it's more of a numbing noise but uh when you're sitting there on the bench watching it all um and and then the foul ball i mean i was sitting right there in the dugout the foul ball where booney and pete converged and uh, it pops out of Booney's glove and Pete's right there. It's almost like, you know, this is why I came to Philadelphia because I saved this team. Right. Um, and um, that was just like, wow, I can't believe I just saw that happen right in front of me. And um, of course, then the horses are coming out and tugs on the mound and the policemen are surrounding the, the warning track. And, and it's just, just like, wow, this is crazy. So uh, take me through that final pitch of Tuggers. Uh, yeah, the, uh, was the bases loaded, right? Bases loaded, two strikes on Willie Wilson. And, um, he had him looking for a screwball away and he threw the fastball right on the inside corner and just kind of froze him. And, um, there was a perfect spot, perfect location. And, and then that was it. So I then it was just... even thinking of the pitch, I mean, it's like watching it, you know, and then hearing you talk about it. Yeah, it's, it's just like it happens in slow motion. Uh, wow, we, we just won the World Series. So, of course, you know, everybody runs out on the field and, and celebration. And um, that was just um, – it, it just seemed like at that point it just had happened so quick, you know. Um, but the whole ninth inning was seemed to take forever. Yeah, we see pictures of our in video of the parade. Um, yeah, and we – I. You know, I, I was there for 08 and the parade afterwards, but I was in Citizens Bank Park, so I wasn't on the street. What is that like going down Broad Street with all of those people hanging from trees, hanging from lampposts, wherever they can see you guys? Like, do you remember moments along the parade route? Oh, yeah. Um, it was long, uh, obviously, from uh, the art museum all the way to JFK. It, it took a long, long time, um, but just mobs of people, um, which never experienced anything like that before. Um, so it was phenomenal. And, and honestly, I wasn't even going to go because I, I was out so late the night before. I was like, I'm not going to go to the parade. And uh, no, 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 you got to go. You got to go. So we ended up going. And, and of course, uh, um, I, I told this story uh, um prior uh that uh, when we got to jfk and finally when it was all over bob walk and dickie and and myself we uh, ended up jumping off the float and we walked back bob walk was living in south philly there and uh so we walked back to his place through all the people and and uh what a what a great time what a great memory all right marty um just a couple other questions it's funny because I, as i was as i was getting ready for this podcast um I didn't realize that you had actually held a, a record for all these years until 2021 uh, when Dylan Lee broke the record and the, the least amount of regular season starts and then to pitch in the World Series. Did you know that was a record that you held? I did not. Something that, uh, yeah, something that was just broken a couple of years ago. He had two major league starts and then pitched in the World Series. But he okay. lasted like four batters. So you did, you fared a little better in the postseason. Than you, did. So uh, you were, That's you, good to know. Exactly, exactly. You know, you talked to me, you mentioned Pete Rose. And, yeah. um, you know, Alumni Weekend happened not too long ago. Uh, you were out there, right? Uh, yes. Alumni Weekend. I thought I saw you on the field. Um, yes. And Pete, of course, came back to the ballpark. Yes. What were your thoughts on having him back? How important was it to represent that team at this point? And, and, you know, really the impact and what you think about Pete Rose. Um, I, I think it was great to see, see him come back. Um, he, he was a, a big part of that, that team. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, my, my feeling on Pete Rose is that he belongs in the hall of fame for, for what he accomplished on the field. Uh, he deserves that. And, and I'm sure that deep down, um, you know, this, this guy's been baseballs his whole life. Um, and, and I think, I think it really, really probably eats at him. Um, so, you know, when you look at the hall of fame, are there guys in there that, have, that, that have done other things uh, considered to be equal or worse? Uh, I'm sure there are, 
But I think for what he accomplished on the field as a player, then then he deserves that. That that's my my feeling on that. And I want to ask another question about Dallas Green because Dallas is one of those guys who was larger than life. Um, yes. Uh, you know, very missed, very old school in his approach to the game. Of course, the old school encompassed everybody on that team for sure, and and the way that you guys played. What did Dallas, what was Dallas like in the clubhouse? And, you know, were you intimidated by him? Very intimidated by him, <laughs> especially coming up through the minor league system. Um, he was a scary man, you know, and um, uh, there wasn't a lot of job security back then. You know, we weren't making a lot of money in the minor leagues. And so at a, any given day, you, you, you had the feeling that you could be sent home. So, um, you know, he demanded respect. Um, and, and I love Dallas. Um, and, uh, and I think he was very instrumental in 1980 with a lot of the veterans on that ball club. Uh, you know, he, he knew how to light a fire under, under them. And, um, um, and, and, you know, nobody was really going to, to get into his face, uh, because, uh, just because of his size and his, his, his boisterous voice, you know, he, he was an intimidating guy for sure. I mean, I, I love Dallas and, um, you know, he did a lot for me in, in, in helping me in my career uh, and, uh, and and getting a lot of those younger guys up that year. And, and I think that blend between that and, and the veterans on that ball club was, was uh, uh, a key factor in, in having success. And then the next year was a strike year and then you had some injury issues. So getting back made it a little bit more complicated. You spent from 1980 to 1985 in the major leagues. Um Anything you would do differently? Anything that you think you could have done to extend your career or any regrets? Um, well, the, the strike year, uh, I, I had um, a little bit of a nagging shoulder. And, um, you know, so the medical staff would say, well, look, you can you can do two things. You got two options. You can either rest it or you've got to learn how to, to, to work through it. And so when the strike happened, I thought that was kind of a blessing that I, I, I could I could rest it. And as the strike went on and on and on, it got to the point where um, I, I didn't think we were coming back. And so I went too long without throwing um, during that period. And uh, if I could do anything different, I, I certainly would have done more then. Um, and, you know, we were out on our own. We didn't have training staffs or anything like that. Um, and uh, so I just chose not, not to, to do any throwing. And then of course, when we came back after a 50 day strike, um, you know, I wanted to go out and prove that I was fine and healthy and all that. And I, and I, I really wasn't. And so that, that's really the, the, the point where I would have done something different. Uh, I think that hurt me, um, going forward. And of course, you know, the following year, 83, we got back to the world series, uh, with the Wee's kids. And uh, we got beat by the Orioles. And, and uh, I, I just, from that point on, I was always having uh, elbow issues or shoulder issues. And um, it, was, uh, it was tough. But you'd reached the pinnacle, which I'm sure gave you some amount of satisfaction. Um, sure. But, it, it, you know, that happened so fast that uh, you expect that this is what's going to happen every year. Um, and, you know, when I went to New York after I was traded, uh, I played with Joe Negro, uh, uh, well, Joe and Phil. And, you know, Phil had pitched 25, 26 years in, in, in the big leagues and never won a World Series. So to do that after being there for 45 days or, or 50 days was uh, was amazing. So uh, certainly feel blessed to be able to to uh, have that, uh, to be able to say, you know, I was part of a world championship team. And now, you know, all these years later, there are certainly some bigger names on that team. Uh, we've listed some. I mean, we didn't even mention Gary Maddox. Like they're just. There, it, it, the list is deep of people who made names for themselves nationally, but I, I think it's fair to say that you are you you're really a Philly legend as much as anything else, as opposed to somebody who's looked out on the national scope. Like Philadelphia, will never forget your contribution to that team. Um, is that something you hold close to your heart? The fact that this city has embraced you the way they have. Cities, the city it has always been great. Um, you know, uh, the the reunion a couple of weeks ago. Uh, number one, I think the Phillies did a, a, a fantastic job um, all the way through, and it was great to come back and see the guys and see the fans. And every time I come, I come back here now. Um, 
you know, these, these are the most knowledgeable fans, sporting fans. Um, and I played in New York. So, um, but um, they, they never forget. Uh, I'll say that they, they never forget. And um, uh, I really appreciate them. You broke a long streak of futility. So, you know, they'll never forget for a lot of reasons, but you really made That's such right. an impact on that team. So Marty Bystrom, so great catching up with you. Good to see you. Uh, and we appreciate you sharing your story. You're welcome. Thank you. Great to see you also. Thanks, Leslie. Up next on Glove Stories, Larry, Charlie, and Murph are going to talk about the guys who are making an impact this year in the 2022 season. That's coming up next. The all-new Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app is here for both Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Get in on all the action, whether it's baseball, the basketball and hockey playoffs, golf, all your favorite sports. Download the all-new Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app and make your first bet risk-free up to $750. Bet more than the score. Bet on individual player performances for hits, home runs, and strikeouts. Bet innings, first team to score, and more. Bet Parks is the only sportsbook and casino app that I recommend. The Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app, where odds, bets, slots, and games all come together in perfect harmony right in your pocket. Sportsbook and all your favorite casino games for real money, all in one amazing app. Live in-game betting lets you bet while you watch the game. Download right now in the App Store, Google Play Store, or at BetParks.com and use my promo code MURPH. Bet Parks is also an official proud betting operator of the PGA Tour. The all-new Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app. You must be 21 and in Pennsylvania or New Jersey. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Welcome to This Week in Philly Baseball History, presented by Shad Vintage Sports. This week in 2000, Jimmy Rollins hit a triple in his major league debut at the Vet. More than 22 years later, J-Roll, along with boxing legend Bernard Hopkins and Negro League pioneer Ed Boulder, will headline the Philadelphia Sports Hall of Fame class of 2022. Celebrate more Philly sports history with clothing from Shad Vintage Sports, where there's a story in every stitch. Visit them at 13th and Walnut Streets or at ShadSports.com. Phillies Nation is your source for breaking news, original analysis, trade insights, and more. Read today's articles at philliesnation.com. And welcome back to Glove Stories with Murph as we welcome in in this segment, as we always do, Charlie Manuel, Larry Boa joining us here on the podcast. Guys, thanks for being with us. And this is the part of the podcast where we like to kind of look at big topics and big picture items. And, I, you know, watching this Phillies team develop over the course of 2022, one of the things I think has been a really great storyline is the development of young players. And you need that if you're going to be a postseason team, a playoff team. And certainly the Phillies have gotten that this year. Uh, so, Charlie, let me start with you. As you watch this team develop and you see guys like Bryson Stott, and uh, Derek Hall and, and uh, Nick Maton making impacts late in the season as this team heads towards the postseason. Does it remind you of uh, any guys that uh, you were around, both in your playing days, your coaching days, that you watched develop and you thought to yourself, this young guy has just gone from young rookie player or young first-year player to, to on his way to superstardom? Murph, I had, uh, when I was in Cleveland, of course, I had Jimmy Tomey. Yeah, it's and, a good one. I was with him. I was with him from, from, from time he was about 19 years old all the way up for, I don't know, 12, 15 years or whatever. And uh, I, you could just see him. He was probably one of the kids that uh, had power. He had the ball come off his bat. Outside that, you know, like, uh, and he had bat to ball skills at time, uh, of course, because he hit 300 a few years. But at the same time, just to set, just to walk a day, everyday process, being around him and have and working with him, and you could see him, uh, you could just see him getting better all the time. And not only myself, but the players and uh, the coaches and managers and all the players on the team. You know, like they used to remark about, you know, like uh, the, he, he would hit a ball hard, and all of a sudden, you know, someone would say, "Well, uh, he, he hit another one hard today. He hit two today yeah. hard." Things like that, you know, like. You could see him growing into a big league player. Manny Ramirez, definitely. You know, like Manny. Manny was a guy who come out of high school, and uh, uh, I've, I've, I've said this before about him. You know, like it, it didn't take him long to get to the big leagues, but they might have could have stuck him in there right at the start, and, and, yeah. uh, and Manny could have hit a fastball. 
but you know, like you sit there and you see them, uh, these guys grow and, uh, they, and, uh, I'm sure Bo sees it too. You know, like they just keep getting better and better. And, uh, uh fortunate for us, we got some guys on our club like that. Yeah, we, we, we really do at this point. And it's been great to watch them grow throughout the season. Larry, I, I have a feeling I know a couple of the names maybe that, that you're going to talk about because uh, here in Philadelphia, we watch them grow as well. Right, right, Murph. And, and you know, in, in the words of the late Gene Mock, uh, there's three phases you go through when you get here. I hope I can play. I think I can play. And then you say, yeah. I know I can play. And, and I really believe guys like Chase and Jimmy, and I had a guy in San Diego and John Cruck, you know, when you first get up here, you're a little intimidated and, you know, you you think you can play up here. And then it, it, it's not as easy as people think. But to watch Chase, you know, Chase is a little bit different because he really didn't have a position. This guy worked harder than anybody I've ever seen in my life. We put him in third. They put him at first. And through his hard work and his dedication, uh, he learned how to play second base at a high level. Not just throw him out there. He played at a high level. And both Jimmy and, and Chase had a lot to do with, obviously, Charlie's guys winning the, the World Series and going back the second time. You know, when you see two guys in the middle of the diamond mature together like that, it makes your job so much easier, whether you're a coach, whether you're a manager. And you can see their confidence gain year after year. And, you know, they were used to early coming up. They didn't play on a lot of pennant contending teams. They were good teams, but never in a pennant race, so to speak. And to see that maturation, once you get involved in a pennant race, something else. And John Cruck was the same way in San Diego. Yeah. Uh, he came out and he had to play first. He had to play the outfield. Uh, one thing he could always do was hit. But to watch that maturation is something that, you know, you look back on and say, man, these guys really worked hard. You got to give them all the credit in the world. I mean, the coaches were there. The manager were there for them. But they're the ones that put in the hard work. Yeah, yeah, and I'll ask both of you this question, so uh, just jump in. But uh, I wonder, yeah, obviously, the talent has to be there. But do you guys think it's more about <clears throat> the work that these guys put in to, to develop that talent, or is it a 50-50 split? I mean, what's the most important aspect of a young player being able to go from, hey, you know, I can be up at this level to, hey, I can really succeed at this level? Either one of you want to take that. <clears throat> Well, I, I, I think the big thing on that is it, it's a combination, I think. Obviously, yeah. if you didn't have the talent, you're not going to be here. So the scouts that signed them and the, and the minor league managers that saw them play saw the ability there. But I've seen guys with ability, and then once they get to the big league, they don't put in the time or the effort. The guys we mentioned, Charlie's guys in, in, in <laughs> Cleveland, the guys here in Philly, those guys literally would come out early. They would work every single day in, in August when it's hot, uh, it didn't matter. They never shortchanged themselves. And I think, like I said, if you didn't have the ability, you're not going to be here. So the ability and the hard work combine them together. And that's what made them great players. I think. Charlie, you, you agree with that? Yeah. I, uh, I kind of go along with that Murph because uh, most of the time our players, you know, like uh, when they, when they start feeling good about themselves and they know, and they know that they uh, belong in the big leagues, and, you know, like, and, and they really want to uh, keep improving every day. And you knew like, it's, and it's not like that they, uh, they slack up or nothing. And good players, it, uh, everyday players, when they, some, they, come, they come out there every day and they get their work done just like always. They don't, yeah. like both said, they don't slack, you know, like, and they, they keep the same uh, mental attitude going through. And uh, you could see uh, you can see that in almost every player that's uh, really uh, becomes a real good player. You know, like you, you can take guys, for instance, that get off slow in the major leagues, but all of a sudden, and then you, you could just sit there and watch them. And uh, I think it, uh, uh, Bison Strzok is going to be one of those guys. He's he he's he's in a he's in a uh, good good place right now because yeah. he's playing every day and he's getting to improve his skills and he's getting to show that he can play at the major league level. And I think bomb is another one of those guys. I think it, uh, you know, like when you look at our, our young players, uh, you know, like uh, and that's exactly how you get to be uh, where you're at. You got to have a yeah. mentally, got to be mentally tough. You got to have a desire to, to work. Definitely. I'm a repetition guy, Murph. I think you learn you Larry, and you both know that. I believe in I believe in reps. I believe with uh, I believe in as, as hitting, working the flaws out of your swing and keeping up with your swing every day. You want to feel good every day about your hitting, 
and uh, I, and I think that that hard work and dedication you find you not only that you learn yourself to be uh, your your best coach and things like that. And uh, you know, like that's a to me, it's a dedication to the guy that's playing the game. And yeah. And, uh, and uh, you like just to keep seeing him and he never, and like Bo said, there's guys that fall by the wayside, you know, like they'll be on top of the world one day and, uh, you know, like on the bottom the next. And, uh, you know, like, and uh, you got to stay with it. You got to go through the hard times or tough times. We, we call it baseball, but it's tough times and it, it definitely, it will bring you back into who you are. Just because that you hit the ball today or pitch good today, it doesn't mean you're going to pitch good tomorrow. It doesn't mean you're going to hit good tomorrow. So, you know, like you got to be up on, on things and you got to be focused on playing the game. And I would say getting back to it, the love to play the game yes. is more probably than anything. Yeah. Yeah. You can't fake your way through uh, 162 year after year if you're not, no. uh, if you don't love this game and, and love to put the work in. Right, Ray Bo? No question. I mean, uh, the love of the game to me is, is, is probably, and that's right after ability because yeah. this is a grind, you know, in football, you can hide for a week in basketball. They play three times. You play every day here. And if you have warts on your team or as an individual, eventually they're going to come out. So you got to stay on top of your game through 162 games and hopefully into the playoffs and world series. So that's what makes this game very interesting. And as Charlie said, if you're not mentally tough to play this game, if you think you're going to go through a whole year without going through some mental, uh, physical droughts, uh, 0 for 18s, making some airs, hanging some sliders, then you're crazy. This game yeah. uh, will humble you in a second. <laughs> no <laughs> doubt about it. I uh, love your perspective, guys. Uh, really great stuff. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for that. Okay, Murph. Yeah. All right, let's yeah. take a quick break. But we'll be right back right after this. Welcome to This Week in Philly Baseball History, presented by Shad Vintage Sports. This week in 2000, Jimmy Rollins hit a triple in his major league debut at the Vet. More than 22 years later, J-Roll, along with boxing legend Bernard Hopkins and Negro League pioneer Ed Boulder, will headline the Philadelphia Sports Hall of Fame class of 2022. Celebrate more Philly sports history with clothing from Shad Vintage Sports, where there's a story in every stitch. Visit them at 13th and Walnut Streets or at ShadSports.com. The all-new Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app is here for both Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Get in on all the action, whether it's baseball, the basketball and hockey playoffs, golf, all your favorite sports. Download the all-new Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app and make your first bet risk-free up to $750. Bet more than the score. Bet on individual player performances for hits, home runs, and strikeouts. Bet innings, first team to score, and more. Bet Parks is the only sportsbook and casino app that I recommend. The Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app, where odds, bets, slots, and games all come together in perfect harmony right in your pocket. Sportsbook and all your favorite casino games for real money, all in one amazing app. Live in-game betting lets you bet while you watch the game. Download right now in the App Store, Google Play Store, or at BetParks.com and use my promo code MURF. Bet Parks is also an official proud betting operator of the PGA Tour. The all-new Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app. You must be 21 and in Pennsylvania or New Jersey. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Phillies Nation is your source for breaking news, original analysis, trade insights, and more. Read today's articles at philliesnation.com. Glove Stories with Murph is sponsored by the Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app, along with Shine Vintage Sports and Phillies Nation, and is a presentation of SBC Media Partners. The engineer for Glove Stories is Chad Evans. Cindy Webster is our marketing and guest relations director, and our executive producer is Roger Haddon. Whether you are watching us on YouTube or downloading the podcast from one of the major podcast providers like Apple, Google, or Spotify, make sure to hit like and subscribe so that we can let you know when a new episode of Glove Stories is available. We'll release new episodes weekly throughout the 2022 Major League Baseball season.